Good job. Good morning. Mike Neen. I got there. My feet don't work. They're not sitting cleanly at the end of the time. We are honored to have the guest speaker with us this morning to share some additional knowledge. Most of these stories will come from our star teachers here as Anishinaabe people. Welcome everybody that showed up today and welcome those on Zoom as well to our spring cultural presentation. <coughs> our guest speaker today is Michael Washington Jesus Christ. He's a traditional ecological knowledge specialist at the Great Lakes Fish and Wildlife Commission, which is headquartered in Modena, Wisconsin. He's an Anishinaabe, an enrolled member of the National Conference Nations in Canada. His role as CEK specialist involves integrating Anishinaabe knowledge, language, cultural perspectives, and ceremony research methods and resource management to make science more culturally relevant. <coughs> Michael did receive his Master of Science in Forestry from the University of Montana and a Bachelor of Art in Biology from Benedictine College in Atchison, Kansas. He also received a certificate of Ojibwe language instruction from the Minty State University. Miigwech, Michael, for being with us today and sharing these stories. Mm -hmm. All of those women and all of those come with them. Now, aha, bonjour, honey. Michael Wasagija condition of cause, Makwa, Nindo, Dem. We quem con, Debing Dalgozian, Midosh Nungum, Wishkong Sing, in Dayan Nungum. Good morning to everyone. My, thank you for that, uh, that nice introduction. Uh, uh, I today live in Wisconsin, one state over, and I learned that, that they call Wisconsin in the Anishinaabe language, Wishkong Sing. So there's a lot of debate over what that. Uh, what that word means, but but it is an Anishinaabe name. So, uh, and I work for the Great Lakes Indian Fish and Wildlife Commission. Uh, I've been there for about two years now, but um, I have about almost 20 years tenure working at tribal colleges in Northern Minnesota. So I worked for Leech Lake Tribal College. I worked for Red Lake Nation College and in White Earth Tribal and Community College. So it really warms my heart to be here today at, at Bay Mills Community College. Uh, uh, I've never been here before. This is my first time to visit, so uh, I'm very honored by that. I started collecting these star stories about 25, maybe a little bit longer than that, uh, years ago. Um, I wanted to learn about uh, uh, the stars, but not only from a Western standpoint, but I wanted to know what our people, our Anishinaabe ancestors knew about the star world. They knew about the cosmos. And I've been on this journey for over a little over 20 years now, uh, learning, collecting, and finding these stories. But when I first started, there were no books written on this subject. So I had to find a story over here, and then I had to find a story over here. And uh, that took a long time to collect uh, some of these stories. And there's also different versions of these stories, too, in different communities. And, and that's okay with our people. Um, we're not like Western science, whether, you know, it is or it isn't, you know, it's black or white, it's right or wrong. Uh, we accept other stories too, that other communities tell uh, about these star legends and, and these spirits. So, um, but I wanted to share a little bit first about how I got started on this journey. And uh, it was a really kind of a fascinating uh, uh, story. Okay, this was working. Yeah, it's a slide. Uh... Oh, there it is. <clears throat> okay, so that's that's an old picture of me right there. Much more gray now than uh, when that picture was taken. So when I was a kid, I I, I was curious about our last name, Wasegizik. I wanted to know what that name meant. And, and I talked to my mom. My mom went through nine years of residential school at, at Spanish. Um, she went in when she was nine years old and came out when she was 18. And 
She had lost her language. She lost her identity as an Anishinaabe woman. She lost uh, all of her cultural ways. And my mom felt really sad that she wasn't able to share a lot of this information with me. So this is one of the reasons why I decided to go on this journey to learn our language and our culture. But I, I started asking, what is our name, Wasagijik? What does that mean? And I talked to several people around Wiki. Um, and they said that, well, Wase, Wase means bright, like outside, Wase, uh, a bright sky, or it's just bright outside. I said, okay, and what does Gijik mean? Well, Gijik means the sky. So Wase Gijik, bright sky. That's a beautiful name. I, I love that. And then I talked to other people and they said, well, Gijik means the daytime. I'm like, okay, I can see the relationship between sky and day. And one year we were up visiting our, 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 our family up there and I talked to my, my cousin Echo, Echo Wase Gijik, and I asked him about the name. And he said, well, Gijik means cedar tree. Okay. So now my Western trained mind is scrambled now. I don't understand now. Uh, Gijik means sky, day, and cedar tree. That, that didn't make any sense to me, whatever. Um, but I went ahead and accepted it. And that question stayed in my mind for most of my, uh, all throughout my 20s and 30s, until finally, I met an elder from Winnipeg. Uh, Manitoba, and he turned out to be one of my, my longtime mentors and, and teachers and a friend. And I asked him, I said, uh, this word Gijik, how come it means sky and it means cedar tree? He says, well, I, I know the answer to your question. He says, it all comes from a creation story that we don't tell anymore. It talked about how our ancient ancestors came down from the star world and they came towards earth and they came through a bugwanegizik, a hole in the sky. And then they climbed down a giant cedar tree and then they populated the earth. So gizik, the cedar tree, is what connected the earth to the star world. And it's the pathway that our ancient ancestors took to, uh, to come to earth. And he said that the cedar tree is sacred to us, and it serves as a cosmological axis for our people, uh, aligning the four levels of the universe. And if you've ever read Basil Johnson's books, he talks about those four levels uh, of the universe that we believe in. And so my brain was just like on fire to learn more of this knowledge. So Gijik, bright, sky or day, and in cedar tree, that's the the journey that I took just to learn the name. And I learned that that, that name is so in depth. It has so much depth and knowledge and, and beauty uh, about our cosmos. And so the next question I have, well, what other names in our language contain this, this depth of information, you know? So the hole in the sky is represented by a star cluster that you can actually go out and see tonight. And it's got, Western science calls it the Pleiades but we know it as the Bhagwanagijik, the hole in the sky. And in the winter, um, mid-January, the Bhagwanagijik is directly overhead uh, in the early winter uh, evening. So uh, that's a pretty powerful symbol for our creation and, and how we came to this earth. <clears throat> so Bhagwanagijik, Bhagwane, made to make a hole, Gijik sky, hole in the sky. <clears throat> so after learning all this knowledge, when I go out into the forest and I come into a cedar, a cedar grove or a cedar swamp, I just feel this sense of reverence and this, and this sense of, of, of sacredness when I enter uh, a cedar swamp. And I noticed when I arrived here yesterday, uh, you all have an enormous amount of cedar trees around here. You know, these are, uh, you got more cedar trees than we do over in uh, northern Minnesota or Wisconsin. Uh, so it really touches my heart to be here and, and, and to see all these cedar trees here and, and actually come here and talk about them. So, so this same elder that, that taught me this, uh, this, the definition of Gijik, his name was Toposonikwit Kinyu, by the way. Um, he also told me this story here too, which 
this story really helped me to connect um, our Anishinaabe culture with, with science. And the story goes like this, that a long time ago uh, in Anishinaabe village way up in the north, um, there was this group of people that lived there and on certain evenings, they would see four stars that were soaring towards them from the east. And one of those stars had kind of a ill temperament. And this star, this one star used to come down, used to swoop over the top of the village to try to scare the people. And this happened periodically over the years until finally the, the people that lived in that village became, they became familiar with, uh, acquainted with these four stars. And they knew what to expect when they came uh, approaching. Well, one evening, as expected, the four stars were coming from the east, coming towards their village, and they knew what was going to happen. And sure enough, the one star decided to swoop down over the people. Only this time, <clears throat> this, the star, <clears throat> excuse me, the star lost control, and it crashed into the earth. And when the star hit the earth, it rumbled the ground and everybody felt it. And everybody stayed in their lodges the whole night. The next day, the elders asked a, a party of young men to go out and investigate to see where this, this star had hit the earth. So the young men took off uh, through the woods and they finally came to the site where the star hit. And what they found was a gigantic hole in the earth. And all the trees all around that hole were all laid flat. So the young men came back and they told the elders what they had saw. And the elders said, well, we don't know who this person was, but I think best we should not go near this place. And so everyone agreed. This kind of became a, a forbidden uh, territory. <clears throat> Over the years, this hole began to fill up full of water and it became a lake. And it was a perfectly round lake, Wawie Gamag. But still, nobody would ever go near that lake. So years had passed, 20, 25, 30 years had passed. Until finally, there were two young teenage boys that decided they were going to go down and uh, explore the, uh, the forbidden lake. So they walked down through the woods until they got down to the shore of this round lake. And then they stood on the edge and it was nice and calm. And then suddenly the water began to swirl in front of them. And then out of the water emerged an animal that they had never seen before. <clears throat> this animal had an incredible stench and it was very vicious and it growled and it lunged at them. Of course, the boys then ran up the hill. They ran back to the village and told the people what they had saw. They apologized for going to the Forbidden Lake, but they told everybody that they had saw this strange animal that emerged from the water. So the next day, the elders sent a party of warriors to go down and check and to see uh, this new being. And when the warriors got to the edge of the round lake, the same thing had happened. The water began to swirl in and up emerged this animal and lunged at them. They did not kill it, though. Instead, they went back up to the village, and they told the elders what they had saw. And the elders at that time were just children when the star had hit uh, previously, and they remembered uh, that lake. So the one elder stood up and said, look, we don't know who this person is, but we will call this person Wingwa Age. And Gwingwa Age means the one who came from a falling star. And this is our name that we have for the Wolverine today. Gwingwa refers to the shaking of the earth when, when that star hit. Age means it came from there. So Gwingwa Age is our, store, is our name for the Wolverine. So when I first heard this story as a young man, I, uh, <clears throat> the first thing that came to me was that that this story, this name, is the recording of an actual uh, observation of a meteorite impact. And of course, our people didn't have a written language back then, so they didn't write it down. But what they did do, they recorded 
that event in our language and in the name of this, uh, this being, Wingwa Aage. And so that is how we recorded information in, in, in the names, in the place names uh, in our language. And so I was just totally blown away by the story. And, and, and that's what started, again, my journey on this uh, path of, uh, of uh, not only seeking these star stories, but, but seeking indigenous knowledge, Anishinaabe knowledge. So this was a powerful story. It really had a transformative effect on me as, a, as, a, as an individual. And uh, yeah, one of the more beautiful stories I've ever heard. Another story I wanted to share with you was some of our teachings of Mishu Bijou. And I know this spirit is really strong in this area. If you go out to um, north central Minnesota, where, where I've lived for the last 20 years, these Mishu Bijou stories are not very strong at all. <clears throat> but I know around here that they are. And so I also began seeking stories about uh, the great underwater panther. <clears throat> This is a picture of my boy when uh, we went to visit uh, uh, Agawa Bay up on the North shore of uh, Lake Superior. He was just uh, four years old in this picture. Now he's uh, six foot five and uh, 200 pounds. So I'm gonna take him up here again. I think his head will be up where the uh, Monsieur Bijou is right about now. But I uh, took him up there to see this place. And then I did some traveling and, and I went to travel to other places to find where these Mishibiju pictographs were. Here's another one here that's really faded. This is a picture that I took in the Boundary Waters uh, canoe area in Northern Minnesota. And you can see it's really faded. So I have a laser pointer here. Right here's the tail. He comes around, here's his body. And he, of course, here's the two horns right here. And then, and then here's his legs right here. This pictograph is so old and faded that a lot of people miss it. They don't even see it. It's right on the edge of the water as you, as you paddle down uh, uh, the Basswood River. And what I come to learn, yes. What I learned was that, yeah, they would take, they would go to a natural, like an artesian spring, you know, where, where you see that the, the mud looks kind of rusty red they would take that uh, mud out of there and then they would mix it with the cartilage of a sturgeon. And then they would cook that until it became kind of uh, emulsified. And then they would use that as a paint. And, and what the cartilage of the sturgeon acted is like a glue. And it held this, and the orange is actually uh, iron oxide. Okay. so. Once they paint these pictographs up there, the glue holds it onto the rock, but something happens. Uh, <clears throat> there's an ion exchange between the iron oxide and the granite. And what these are actually are stains on the rock. So the paint, the cartilage has all been washed away, you know, hundreds of years ago. But what it left was a, a permanent stain on the rock, which will be there until, until the rock is not there anymore. People have tried to vandalize these, you know, they tried to spray paint them and, um, but the spray paint usually ends up flaking off after maybe a year or two, but the rock paintings will, are still there, will always be there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and these rock paintings go all the way from Saskatchewan all the way over to uh, Nova Scotia. Uh, people had shared this, this, this technology, this, this knowledge, and they made rock paintings all across the shelf. So yeah, it's, it's amazing how they, how they knew to do that, you know, where it would be there from now on. And as you see in this picture here too, the rock is beginning to flake on the, these white areas. Uh, and that's because of the over the years, the, the, the warming and the, and the freezing, the warming and the freezing, and eventually, eventually these pictographs will, will flake off, but hopefully it'll be hundreds of years from now. So one thing I began to, to realize about these paintings is that wherever you see one of these paintings, 
Okay, this is at the bottom of a waterfall, Basswood Falls. Okay. This rock painting here, if you've ever visited that place, you'll, you'll know that it sits, the rock painting, there's a, uh, a sharp ledge which goes down into the water. And on a calm day, you can walk out there pretty safely to see the pictograph. However, if it's a day where there's waves splashing up on the rock, if you were to ever get swept off of that rock, you'd have a very hard time uh, getting back, getting back on your feet, back up on the, on the rock there. So I found out that these spirits, wherever there's dangerous water, it's where you find these pictographs. Um, and here's one more here. This pictograph here, this is actually a, a Michigane, a big, uh, the great underwater serpent or the, or the, the, the snake. <clears throat> this is at Darkey Lake in, uh, in uh, Ontario. Again, you can see this, uh, the five canoes, you see the moose, which is um, uh, an aquatic uh, ungulate. And then you see the serpent coming up from under them and trying to make its way above them. So again, these, uh, and this is just my idea, my thinking that these, these pictographs serve to, to warn people that there's a spirit here that lives in these waters and people have been hurt or they have died here. So it's best that you appease them, bring your tobacco, your sema, and uh, make sure that you have a safe passage. And I just heard a story last night from uh, one of your elders about a uh, Bijou that lives on the point up here. And of course that point, I, I assume, uh, is very turbulent, treacherous water, very dangerous. And he said that Michibijou lives uh, near that point there. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm just amazed every time I hear uh, these stories that our that our ancestors knew you know, a long time ago. So I don't know if any of you've been ice fishing, but if you've been out on the lake when it's frozen in in about this time of year in March, mid March, and if you've ever felt the ice rumble. Okay, uh, some of our elders say that uh, that rumble is the result of these, these spirits, um, these Mishibijiwag, they've been trapped under the ice all winter. And as the days get longer and longer and longer, they're wanting to bust out from under the ice. So their tails are hitting the bottom of the ice and causing the ice to rumble. And anybody who ice fishes in, in, uh, in late March or in, or in the late, late part of the winter time, uh, have felt that rumble before. Of course, there is a scientific explanation to that too. There's air pockets underneath the uh, ice that's, that's shooting back and forth across the lake, you know, just before breakup. <clears throat> well, that's, that's science's explanation of what this is. Our explanation is that it's the Mishibijiwag underneath the ice. And that's the one that I choose to believe about this phenomena, but they're both correct. So consequently, in this time of year, there's also, let's see, this is north, south. So tonight at sundown, if you look a little bit southeast, you'll see a constellation that's rising on the eastern horizon. And this is a star constellation that was taught to me by an elder uh, named uh, Carl Gaboy from Boys Fort. And this is the Mishibiju constellation. And it's a, the perfect uh, image uh, of a cougar or a mountain lion with a long tail. And you can see that tail. If you find that tail, you'll be able to find the entire constellation. The stars that make up the head though are a little dim. So you'll really have to be out there on a clear night and you'll have to be patient uh, when you find them. <clears throat> but this is our star constellation, Mishibiju. And Consequently, as this constellation begins to move into the center of the sky, that's when breakup is happening. And that's when you feel those, that rumble in the ice. And so those two things happen at the same time. So according to our teachings, as this constellation gets higher and higher, uh, we're getting closer and closer to breakup, uh, the ice breaking up. And uh, it, it, it could be a dangerous time to be out on the ice during this time. So, uh, so if you watch for this constellation here, and here's what the tail looks like. It basically looks like a backwards uh, question mark. Uh, but this is the easiest way to find it is to look for, look for that tail. 
And for those of you that were, I'm not sure what, those of you who had the zodiac sign Leo, if you're a Leo, this is, uh, this is actually the head of Leo the lion in the, in the zodiac. So, uh, so there's multiple dimensions of this, uh, of this, uh, this star constellation. Okay. So I put together this, uh, this, this chart here to talk about the battles between the sky world and the underworld. And some people have described this, this battle. I think Basil Johnson wrote about this battle, the battle between Bibun and Zigwin. Bibun being the old man winter and Zigwin being the young warrior. <clears throat> Other teachings are, this is a, a, a spring battle between the Thunderbirds and the Mishibiju. And if you look at this chart here, the skies are governed by the Animakig, uh, or some people call them Bene Siwag, uh, the Thunderbirds. The underworld is ruled by Mishibiju, the great underwater panther. And us humans, we live on this really thin line between the, these, two, these two realms in our universe. And so it is our obligation to always appease these spirits and, and give tobacco to them. Uh, we always give tobacco when the Thunderbirds return in the springtime. And we give tobacco when we cross big bodies of water for our safety. And we're acknowledging these spirits uh, in our cosmos. So this is just kind of a, a little diagram here to kind of demonstrate that, that relationship between the sky world and the underworld. Again, there's a, there's a lot of Anishinaabe artists that, that like to paint these, uh, these battle scenes between the sky world and the underworld, and, and you'll see a lot of these. But if you ever see, like in the right there, if you ever see this in nature, that is a really cosmic event and, and is definitely worth uh, taking a look at, the battle between the Thunderbirds and the underworld serpents. And I've come to find out that not only do we share these teachings, but uh, the native indigenous peoples from South America and Central America also have teachings around thunderbir or thunderbirds and serpents as well. So this is a, a very powerful phenomenon uh, in our world. <clears throat> Another story that I want to uh, share with you <clears throat> is the story of... Uh, Anungo, Anungo Kwe, Star Woman. And it goes like this. In a small village of Anishinaabe people, that's the way all my stories start out with. In a small village of Anishinaabe people, one evening they saw a star on the eastern horizon. A star they hadn't seen before. And over the days, that star became brighter and brighter. And as that star became brighter and brighter, more and more people began to gather in the early evening to see the star. And it kept approaching, coming towards them. And over several weeks, they watched the star. It took a long time for it to come to them. Until finally, the star was nearly overhead of them, and they noticed that the star was in the shape of a woman. And the star floated above the village, and it began to speak to the people. And the star woman said to the people there, I've been watching you over the years, and I love the way that you take care of your children. I love the way that you treat one another and that you share everything that you harvest. I love that the way you, I love how you live in a good way. And I want to come here and live among your people. Well, the people in the village there were, were, were a little taken, but at the same time, very honored by this request from this star woman from uh, the star world. And so they met among each other, discussed it, and then they all agreed to let the woman come and live with them. So they told the star woman, yes, you can live with us. The star woman was very happy. And she said, well, where, where can I live? And she began to look around the village. Well, I don't want to live up in the trees because I would be too far away from the people. And I don't want to live right in the middle of your village because I don't want to get in the way of your, of your daily activities. 
and she began to look around the village and then she looked at the shore of the lake where all the children were playing and all the women went there to gather their water uh, for their families. And she said, that's where I would like to live. So everybody in the village agreed, yes, then that can be your, your new home. Well, then all of a sudden the star woman began to rise up into the air and everybody's eyes grew big. And then all of a sudden the star woman plunged into the water and disappeared. When daytime come, they looked and looked and looked, and they didn't see her. And they kept searching for her, but she just disappeared. And then fall came, there was no sign of her. Then winter came, the lakes froze over, there was no sign of her. Then the thaw came, the ice broke up, and there was still no sign of her. And they'd all wondered, where did she go? She said she wanted to live with us, where did she go? In that place where she said she wanted to live, <clears throat> all of a sudden, these flowers began to emerge from the water, and there were hundreds of them. And then they all of a sudden, they just went right down the, uh, the shore of the lake. And they resembled the star when they first seen the star in the east. And so the village came to realize that this was the star woman who had came to them and wanted to live among them. And she changed herself into a white water lily. So our name for the white water lily in Anishinaabemowin is Anungo Bekobise, which means the star that plunged into the water. And this is what we call the, uh, the white water lily in our language. So we have a connection with this flower uh, and the star world uh, through that story. But this is the story of, of Anungo Kwe, the star woman. I like this story because it's all about love and gentleness. It's not about stars crashing into the earth and wolverines chasing you up the hill. So it's a nice story. Do you all have fishers here in Bay Mills? Yeah. The fishers are almost all killed out in northern Minnesota. They're, they've they've been trapped heavily and and they're almost becoming an endangered species. Um, but this beautiful animal in our language, we call Ojig, Ojig, the fisher. And we have a star constellation after, named after Ojig. But first I wanna tell you the story of Ojig. And this happened with the springtime. And this is way before, um, uh, our human involvement. This is back in the day when the animals could talk to one another, this story. So one spring, after the snows had thawed and it began to green up, the animals had realized that the birds were not returning from the spring. There were no birds in sight anywhere. And so they began to inquire with one another, what happened to the birds? Where are they? They didn't come back from the spring. And then one animal, the porcupine looked up into the sky and he noticed the birds were flying in, but they were disappearing into the clouds, never seen again. And so all the animals gathered together and like, we need to go investigate and see what's happening here with, uh, uh, with the birds. And they noticed that this cloud was very near a very tall cedar tree. And so the, the animals discussed among them, somebody needs to go up and investigate who is going to climb up that giant cedar and see what is happening to our relatives, the birds. Well, the porcupine said, well, I can't do it because I'm a very slow climber. The bear said, well, I'm too big because as soon as I get on those thin limbs, I'm gonna break the limbs and fall out. And the wolf said, well, I can't even climb at all. So finally, the fisher said, look, I'm a great climber. I will investigate. So the fisher began to climb up the cedar tree. And it was a giant cedar all the way up into the clouds. Until fisher finally got near the top of the clouds. And then suddenly, he saw a bug in the a hole in the sky. And he leaped from the cedar tree and into the hole in the sky. Now he was into the cloud world. And what he found up there was that this angry cloud spirit was capturing the birds and holding them captive inside these, these clouds. 
And the spirit was working very busy to capture as many as he could. And he had thousands of birds up here captured. So the fisher using his long tail, he swished his tail and actually dissolved one of the clouds and set the birds free. And he realized this is how I'm gonna free the birds. So he ran through the clouds, swishing his tail, breaking up all these, these cloud cages, if you will, releasing the birds. And the birds frantically flew towards the hole in the sky and back to earth. Until finally, just when OG, the fisher, had freed almost all the birds, the cloud spirit saw what he was doing. And then the cloud spirit drew his bow and arrow and shot at him, but missed the first time. But Fisher just kept swooshing his tail and freeing the more birds until finally he freed the very last ones. And after those birds flew towards the, the hole in the sky, he ran for the hole in the sky as well to get back home. And just as Fisher began to leap through that hole in the sky, that cloud spirit shot an arrow and hit him right in the tail. And when Fisher, when Fisher leaped for the cedar tree, he missed because of that arrow. And Ojik fell to the ground and he died. Well, all the animals gathered around Fisher and they were saddened uh, uh, that he had perished, but they were grateful to him that he was brave enough to go up there and free the birds so they could come back in the springtime. And so Gijimanadu was, was, uh, was watching this whole event. So Gijimanadu grabbed up a handful of stones and all of a sudden he threw them up into the sky and he created a star constellation that we know today is Oji Ganung, uh, the Fisher Star Constellation. And if you notice, there is a, uh, 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 the Big Dipper lies inside the Fisher Constellation there. You can see the, the, uh, the bale, the handle. But our constellation extends out, the head extends out forward, the feet, the tail. And on clear nights, you can actually see the two stars that represent the arrow that hit Fisher in the tail and caused him to uh, the perish that day. So this is also a really powerful constellation talking about the springtime. And if you go out tonight and look north, you'll see uh, Ojig, Ojiganung, starting to move upward in the sky. And he'll be looking straight up. And that's usually the springtime when, when he is uh, in that position. So, OG Ganung, the fisher. Also, while you're looking in that direction around the North Star, you'll also find another constellation there. Many of you may know it as the Little Dipper. But in our Nishabi teachings, that that constellation is called Mong, which is the, the loon. And if you look at the loon's back there, all those little dots on his back represent the star world. And one thing about the loon is that the loon can plunge underneath the water and swim for, for uh, a great, a long ways. And the loon can actually fly into the sky world. The one place where the loon has trouble uh, uh, moving is on earth. Uh, the loon has a hard time walking on the ground. So he spends most of his time either in the water or in the sky. And this is what the constellation looks like. It's in the perfect shape of a loon uh, setting on the water. And if you notice the, the very tip of the tail feather there, that one star there is called Polaris, and that is our North Star. That's the star that doesn't move, and all the other stars appear to swirl around it. The reason why that star doesn't move is because the axis of our Earth, the axis on which our Earth spins on, is in direct alignment with Polaris. So uh, that's why it appears that it doesn't, uh, it doesn't move. Our Anishinaabe people use these constellations as uh, nighttime navigation. If you got caught away from home and it was dark, you needed to know where north was. And these, these, these constellations with these stories were reminders of uh, 
which way is north. And it was the best way to find your way home uh, in the nighttime. Okay, so this is Mong. Of course, here's a, a relationship between uh, Ojiganung and Mong. And if you notice, this is, this is, what they, this is how they teach the Boy Scouts how to uh, find the North Star. If you take those two stars and, uh, at Ojig's shoulders, they align perfectly with the North Star because the North Star is a little dim. It's a little, little hard to see. It's a very long ways away, uh, but that's how you find North. And then throughout the year, Ojig will make its way around the North Star. And of course, there are times of the year when the loon is completely upside down, but this acts as a clock for our people. Uh, there are certain positions of these constellations when it's uh, maple sugar season. There are certain positions of these constellations when it's time to harvest the wild rice. We just have to go back and relearn uh, this clock again. And uh, instead of relying upon our clock on our wrist, this should be our traditional clock. Uh -huh. I've got just a couple more uh, constellations here, but of course, this is a very prominent constellation to everyone. And if you see, that's north, this is south. So in the early evening, if you face south and look a little bit over here, you'll see Gabibone Ked. Uh, other communities call him Babone Ked Winine. This is called the Great the Wintermaker. And if you follow the movement of this constellation in the early evenings, this constellation rises in the east in about late November. Of course, that's about the time snowfall begins. And as you watch that constellation throughout the winter, each night, it's just a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, until finally, um, this constellation begins to sink below the western horizon in about mid-early April. Of course, that's the time that our ice is breaking away and spring is coming. So the whole time that it's winter, uh, this spirit is in the uh, southern sky, making his way across. There's a lot of stories about the winter maker and Nanabojo um, battling one another. <laughs> There's a lot of battles in, in our cosmology. It's uh, not all love and peace and harmony. Sometimes there's a lot of battles going on out there uh, in the cosmos, according to Anishinaabe. So this is the... Uh, the winter maker, God be born a kid. This is one of the, probably the easiest constellations to find. It's very prominent. The last constellation I want to share with you, this is one, this is a summertime uh, constellation. And I use this when I'm, when I'm working with uh, young people, especially young people that are struggling with, with life and, and with, with drugs and, and whatnot. You know, I'm not a social worker. I'm not a counselor. Uh, but what I do when people ask me about, you know, their problems, I, I, I share this constellation with them. This is a summertime constellation. A lot of people know it as uh, Corona Borealis. Uh, other people in the Anishinaabe community call this constellation uh, Madu de Swan, uh, the sweat lodge. I call this constellation uh, Gimishoma Sinanik which is, which means our grandfathers. And when I tell them to go find this, I tell them, go look for the seven, first learn the seven teachings of our Anishinaabe people, the seven grandfather teachings. And I noticed when I came into college, they were right on the walls, just as I was coming in. I have a few different words for some of the teachings, but what I tell them is that that first star up on top of there, once you find this constellation, I want you to start to recite these teachings. So the first one is de bue win, truth. De o de meaning heart, we, making the sound, speaking the truth. I always speak the truth. Hwai a kwatsun, honesty, walking a straight path, um, being honest with everybody, being honest with yourself, making sure that you're walking a good path, a good straight path. The next one, a name does one. I know a lot of people have different words for humility. Uh, this is the one I learned from Bob Jordan, who is a, an elder at uh, Leech Lake. 
Enin Dizot, to, to always think about yourself and reflect on yourself and think about how you've spoken to others and treated others. Always reflect on yourself and that will give you humility. Menage Edwin. Menage, going easy on one another. Menage, going easy. Menage Ede, going easy on one another. Uh, this is the word for respect. It's a lot different from the military definition of respect, like you do this or else, respect me. Uh, our people uh, talked about being gentle with one another, going easy on one another. Jawain Duin, showing love and compassion for one another. Uh, this is another powerful teaching as well. The sixth one, Zungide Ewen, Zunge, meaning strong, Zungide a strong heart, having a strong heart, standing up for yourself, speaking with, with confidence. Zungide'e um, courage. And then the last teaching, which is a culmination of all of these teachings, is Nibwakawin, wisdom. And I've learned from some of the elders that you, do, you just don't go out and read a book and get wisdom. Um, you have to suffer in life. You have to have things happen to you in order to learn from those experiences. And that's the difference between knowledge and wisdom is that you have a more in-depth understanding when you've had to suffer yourself or you've had to struggle with, with a certain thing and overcome. And you've learned some lessons from that. That's hard to achieve, wisdom. But uh, that's what we call that in our language, nibwa kawin. Yeah, I um, well, first, where I first learned about these teachings was from reading Basil Johnston and Eddie Benton Benet. And when I looked at Eddie Benton Benet's book, he had the elders kind of sitting in almost a, almost like a crescent moon circle. And one, and I read that years ago, one night when I was out looking at that constellation, and I found it in the summer. And as soon as I looked up there, I, saw, I thought of that picture in Eddie Benton's book, the Mashomas book, and it looked, it looked identical to me. And so um, this is just me kind of reflected on this for many years. And uh, and finally, I decided to bring it forward and, uh, and share it with some, some people that I knew. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And this constellation is hard to find. The stars are a little dim, so you just can't go out and just find it and grab it. I mean, you really have to sit, search for it. You have to recognize the part of the sky it's in so you can find it again. It takes some effort, and I think that effort, you know, if you're struggling hard to find that constellation, you're also putting effort towards your own well-being, you know, and, and your, own, you know, your own good life. So uh, I think that's all part of the process. Debway win. Oh, so in Western society, they call this Corona Borealis, the Northern Crown. Um, some of our Anishinaabe people call this uh, uh, Madhu de Swan, which is the, the sweat lodge. Yeah. <clears throat> and this is in uh, Carl Gaboy's book that he wrote on Talking Sky. He talked about this constellation being, being the, the sweat lodge. Talking Sky, yep, by uh, Carl Gaboy. And he's, uh, he's an elder now from uh, uh, Net Lake or, or Boys Fort, northern Minnesota. How long what? Yeah, I've been working on a book like forever, so I don't, I don't know when it's... Hopefully I'm going to get it done, done soon, so... But, uh... Oh... Mm -hmm. 
spoken with lots of elders that had that knowledge as well, like mm -hmm. yourself. Mm -hmm. And um, it's important for us to recognize that those star beings are what we would call like the money group. Mm -hmm. And they actually exist in creation. They're not just um, mythological figures or fairy tale characters, but in fact, they are the spiritual beings um, that I would say in an English way, in an English translation would be like um, helpers of the great spirit or God or the great mystery. So when we offer our Sema, when we're thinking about the um, um, or the seven grandfathers, there are also seven grandmothers mm -hmm. that are seated in the Ishpaming mm -hmm. uh, above us. Mm -hmm. And they are the ones, along with many other spiritual beings that receive the prayers or petitions or the thanks or whatever we're putting into our Sema, they receive those. And mm -hmm. it was through their instructions and guidance that in even the Mishomas book where Eddie Benton is repeating information that he received from those ancient birchbark scrolls where he's putting down um, information about our ancestors and the teachings that they gave to us on the earth. Mm -hmm. And that's really old. It's like uh, in, in the Middle East, they have the papyrus scrolls, whereas in our ancestry, we have birch bark scrolls. Mm -hmm. And it's every bit as sacred. And the knowledge of some of these spiritual beings um, is protected, even to the point where we will only share them when you talk about Manabojo or Winabojo or Manabojo. They're shared only in the winter months because of the divine nature of these words, these stories uh, invokes those money do. And there's protection there for us. So there, it's very important that when the star stories, I believe, can be shared any time of the year. But when we enter into the Manabojo or Winabojo, Manabojo stories, those are saved and reserved for winter. Mm -hmm. So that's, I just wanted to add a little bit of that to this um, gathering because uh, it's through those great spirit ancestors, like our, they would call him our uncle, who was half human and half spirit. And it was, let's say, through his uh, battling, if you will, with mm -hmm. these money do that cause fever or sickness that we now today have cures. Whereas in the past, before that battle and before he won that battle, there was no fear, mm -hmm. you know? So we have a lot of stories that come down to us from prior to the flood. And that's what he's sharing with us. And, and um, those stories, well, for instance, were plagiarized or whatever the word is, and stolen and taken to Europe and brought back to us in the form of Mother Goose or Grimm's fairy tales, like Jack and the Beanstalk. Um, they didn't have beans in Europe. Beans are indigenous to North America. And that's the sky world that, that Jack ascended into. Or even like the Hansel and Gretel story is part of a greater story of the origin of the whitefish. And it's, it, you know, it's taken apart like that. Mm -hmm. We have protocols for um, when these stories are shared and and so I just want to remind everybody of that and say me quetch for allowing us to even have access to these stories today. We did this with Sema. We mm -hmm. offered tobacco so that we would have permission and protection to share, share these ancient sacred scroll teachings, even though they're just parts of them. So I just wanted to say me quetch for that. No, no. The one thing I've come to learn studying the language and studying the, studying the culture, and be much for that, Kathy, is that according to our, our language, we live in a very, we live in an animate living universe. You know, we don't live in a dead universe where rocks are dead and the water's dead and, and there are resources that we can just exploit. Uh, we live in an animate universe that, like you said, there are spirits all throughout our universe that we, to, we need to acknowledge. Um, and that may be the reason why we're struggling in the earth today with, with climate change and, and, and with toxins in the air and with uh, the, the, the loss of biodiversity on our planet. 
is because society in general has not learned to respect uh, the world that they live in. They've chosen to exploit it. And there's going to be a consequence for that. There will be a consequence for that. Yeah, I would dare to say that a lot of our youth that struggle today probably don't know stories like this. They don't know their language. And that would be such good medicine for them, you know, for their spirit and their identity. Yeah. So it's, it's an honor for me to be able to, to share uh, these stories with all of you. And again, miigwech uh, for all of you that uh, invited me to come here and speak. Oh, and there's our, the name, Gimishoma Sinanik, our, our grandfather teachings. Okay. So I just want to say, uh, thank you for listening for me to me here today. And uh, again, it's been a pleasure for me uh, to speak with you. And, and uh, if there's any questions or comments you'd like to share, uh, we can do that now. No. Uh, Pardon me? You said no? No, I said no. Nah <laughs> no, I didn't say no. Well, um, yeah, if there's no questions, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, Cheryl, this is my cousin back here in the back, by the way. We're, uh, we're, we're related. And then Richie was here last night with another cousin of mine. So it, it was, um, I, I presented in a lot of Anishinaabe communities, but this is the first time I've ever came someplace where I had relatives in the, uh, in the audience. So, uh, yeah, I'm very honored by that. Good question. Um, if you Google my name, Michael Wasegizik Price, I actually did this uh, presentation at the National Museum of the American Indian in Washington, D.C., and I did that back in 2014. Um, it's been a long time ago. The stories have gotten a little better since then. So, uh, but uh, if you uh, if you look me up on the web, you'll you'll find a, a couple more stories that I haven't talked about here tonight. Uh, but like I said, this is this is kind of a life journey for me. Not just it's not a job. It's uh, you know, what happened to my mother in residential schools, having her identity taken away in her language. I had to spend the rest of my life trying to to reverse that damage to her life and make sure that it didn't happen to me or to my my children or my grandchildren. You know, hopefully I'm going to have grandchildren here one day. Born, you know, your parents made it, and they registered it just to get a registry before you're 18. And if you turn 18, you can't like go register yourself anymore. So then you're not native. So then, like, where are you? No, you're, you're still native. It's just, you are, but not yeah. to the government. Right. Well, wow. I try to minimize the government's impact on my identity at all costs. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I hear you. Okay, now how me? Oh, do you have a question? The the show, Miss Sinani. Uh huh. It, I know you said that's the summertime. About June is when it begins to start really rising in the east. All stars go from the eastern horizon across the sky into the west. Um, around June is when you'll start to see it. And there'll be a big red star next to it. Um, the red, that red, red star in astronomy is called Arcturus. And if you look and find that red star, 
you'll be able to locate, it'll be in the vicinity of that, uh, that big red star. But that's a summertime constellation, so. So when we look at those stars, are we supposed to put out the back ends? It would be good, yeah. Before we like date, are we supposed to put out the back I, That's according to your, your teachers and your elders. Mm -hmm. You're talking about the pictographs. We have a place up here, a little part of their east called Vermilion. Mm -hmm. And that's where we got a lot of our red earth. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or whatever we use it for. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Well, we also have um, lots and lots of that red clay, and there are uh, many artesian wells over there near that over by where you're actually staying at that resort mm -hmm. across the road and the hills in there and people we were told people used to travel here a long time ago to come here to get that clay because mm -hmm. it was the kind like right now you can order it online and pay a lot of money for it mm -hmm. it's the kind that they would use to make pottery with also oh yeah uh -huh. yeah that red clay yeah and, uh, i think they found clay pipes here well, you know, different times. In fact, Wanda, your mother told me they found <coughs> clay pipes in the yard. There. Oh, all over the place. Mm -hmm. There are different types of colors of clay. Right. Mm -hmm. these are, these are yeah, so that, that redness in the clay is actually iron oxide, which is rust, basically. But if you go down to uh, southern Minnesota, there's a uh, the place called Mankato. In the Dakota language, Mankato means blue earth. And if you look at the banks of the river, the, it is kind of a grayish blue. And that's when the iron becomes in what they call a reduced state. So it has an electron pulled off of it and takes off the oxide. So therefore the iron turns a blue color. And of course that place there, that place there blue earth has been called that for centuries by the, uh, the Dakota people. So yeah, a lot, there's a lot of chemistry too behind uh, a lot of the stories that we have. Uh, Breaking, breaking it down, down. That, they that tried to preserve a pictograph yeah they tried oh. to preserve it with light by putting something on it which and, uh, which ended up yeah also oh, it disintegrated the granite yeah. then yeah yeah so uh, the, the knowledge that we had was much much better at the yeah. at last mm -hmm. than the modern technology that we just Scientists always try to fix everything, fix the earth, fix the climate. If they would just let the earth and the climate heal itself, like what we've been taught, um, that would be a much better path for all of us. But yeah, this tampering with things usually doesn't end up uh, in a good way. So, mm -hmm. Yes. Somebody was wondering if you are going to publish a book. Yes, I'm working on a book. In fact, now that uh, there's been several questions already, I need to get home and start getting busy on this thing. I've been sitting on it for quite a few years. But yes, there's one coming. Yeah. Okay, Nahal, miigwech. I'll be, I'll be around if you guys want to chat uh, about some new star stories, but uh, thank you for your time. Miigwech.